last week's parsha, the beginning puts together, juxtaposes two institutions. One is the institution of Sota, and the other is the institution of Nazir. Sota takes place when a woman violates, married woman violates the biblical law of being alone, alone, unobserved, unobservable, with another man. That itself is a biblical law. Her husband warns her. He says, warning you not to do that. He doesn't need to warn her. It's forbidden by biblical law. But he warns her anyway in front of witnesses. And then witnesses testified that she did it. Then there is at least a suspicion that she committed adultery. Yeah. That she committed adultery or that she was um, in a concealed room with another man? No, no, we have witnesses that she did that. That's not a suspicion. We know she did that. We know it. We have witnesses who saw her go in and saw... After she had been warned. After she had been warned. There are witnesses that she was warned. There are witnesses that she went into the room. With the, right? We know she did that. The question is, what did she do in that room when no one was looking? Right? Which creates a prohibition against the husband living with her. Then there's a, a procedure called SOTA where she can clear herself. This is optional on her part. She doesn't want to do it. She doesn't have to do it. If she knows she's guilty, then she'll be played safe and she won't do it. But if she wants to, she can go to the temple, and at the temple she will be treated with great disgrace. Her hair will be uncovered and disheveled, and her garments in certain places will be ripped, and she'll be treated as a criminal. She is a criminal because she went into a private seclusion with that other man, which she's not allowed to do. And then she'll be forced to drink water, which has in it some dust from the from the, the, the dirt of the, of the floor of the, of the um, temple, plus the ink from a parchment in which the paragraph of Sota is written, and that ink is blotted into the, into the water. She has to drink it, and if she's guilty, then she will die a very grossly disfiguring death. As I said, this is voluntary in her part. She doesn't have to do it. If she knows she's guilty, if she wants to stay alive, she doesn't have to do it. But if she's innocent, then I say innocent of adultery. Guilty she is because she went into hiding. But if she's innocent of adultery, she wants to restore the marriage, she can undergo this procedure. The purpose of the procedure is to restore the marriage. That's what it says in Chazal. And says even, look how much God cares about marriage, that he allows his name to be blotted out in order to save the marriage. Fine. Now, why is this institution described in the Torah back to back with the institution of the Nazarite. Nazarite is a person who takes a vow, which has basically three consequences. One is he can't ingest anything that comes from grapes, including wine and grape juice and the grapes themselves and the seeds and the, and the peels and the whole thing. And he has to grow his hair <clears throat> without trimming it in any way. And he can't contract the tumor of contact with the dead. Go into a cemetery, go to a, uh, a, um, a uh, levaya, a, a, a funeral, if the way he'd be in the funeral would contract that tumor. He can't allow, he's not allowed to do any of those three things. And the question is, why is that back to back with the Sota institution? So the Talmud makes a famous remark, which becomes the subject of a lot of discussion, and that is, someone who sees the Sota woman, in her disgrace, should take a vow not to drink wine. That's why it's back to back. Becoming a Nazir is a kind of antidote for the experience of seeing the Sota woman in her disgrace. Uh, superficially, naively, the thought is, wine leads people to irresponsible behavior and this kind of behavior is very irresponsible and has very serious consequences. So take care. Make sure that you're not put in compromising positions by drinking wine. That's the naive thought. Now there are two problems. 
One problem is that when the Gemara discusses the Nazir, according to some opinions among Tanoim, the Nazir is called a sinner. The Nazir is called a sinner. Uh, the phraseology in the Torah is Asher Chota Ala Nefesh. He sinned on the soul. He sinned on the soul. So the Gemara says, what soul is that? The answer is, he sinned on his own soul because he deprived himself of wine. He's a sinner against his own soul because he deprived himself of wine. And then the Gemara goes on to say, all the more so someone who undertakes a fast, a total fast. <clears throat> Anyone who fasts, they say, is called a sinner because he deprived himself of everything. And as the commentaries point out, a, a, a nazir is a nazir for at least 30 days. This, if he doesn't specify a time period, it's 30 days. He can specify a longer period, time period, but not less. Um, a fast is a one-day deal, but it's a one day, including all food and drink. And therefore, on the orientation that the nazir is a sinner because he deprived himself of wine, so then someone who under, undertakes a, a, a fast is also called a sinner. Now, I just want to alert you to something which is very important everywhere. General rules always have exceptions. General rules always have exceptions. You cannot object to the Talmudic statement that all A's are B's. You say, oh, I found that A that's not a B. That's not an objection. Because in Talmudic usage, all general rules have exceptions. They are expected to have exceptions. So that being the case, if you find a counterexample, Wonderful. Order yourself a beer. Now, that's expected. It's natural. Rabbi Yochanan even said, in Lameda Mina Klolos, we do not learn rules from general statements in the Talmudic literature. Suppose the Talmudic statement says, all these are bees except for X, Y, Z. But then the statement listed the exceptions. Even then, there are extra exceptions. Now, there's exceptions of one type, the type that was interesting to discussion at hand. So all rules are ex accepted are expected to have exceptions. So that's Therefore, it's not for us a... Uh, so, when we say fasting, there will be some people for whom fasting is good, and so on and so on. But the general rule, there is a general rule, that there's something wrong with fasting. There can be exceptions, but there's something wrong with fasting. It's learned from the, from the Nazir, where there's an accepted rule, though there are exceptions, and where itself discusses one, uh, that he deprived himself of wine. So, that paints wine in a positive light. He's a sinner because he deprived himself of wine. So is wine good or bad? Now, you could say, sometimes yes and sometimes no. It depends on who you are. It depends upon what situation you're in. It depends upon what your circumstances are. It depends on what you're doing at the time. If you're making kiddush in front of 25 people, the chance is that three or four ounces of wine is going to lead you to seriously compromising behavior in a public setting like that where you're doing a mitzvah and it's Shabbos, very unlikely. And if you're at the local pub, uh, so then that's another matter. Drinking at the pub with friends is going to could very well lead you to that. That's one way to look at it. But there's a deeper problem. It's a deeper problem. This might have been pointed out to me. Let's look at the Sota statement again. Hazal said, someone who sees the Sota woman in her disgrace, in her disgrace, should take a vow not to drink wine. Why is that? He's seeing her in her disgrace. He's seeing her being punished. He's seeing the effects that loose behavior brings to a person. Why isn't that lesson enough? Why doesn't that provide by itself Negative motivation, motivation to make sure that you don't get caught in this kind of behavior. Why must you have an extra protective? I mean, it's so interesting. This is so often the case in Chazal. They say you see her in her disgrace. They don't say you see a Sota woman. You see her bekilkula in her disgrace. Then you have to take a vow not to, not to drink wine. Yeah. So the Nazir couldn't do the Kiddush on the Friday night? Correct. There's only two ways out. He can listen to somebody else, mm -hmm. or he can do it on bread. That he can do. But, but the Kiddush on wine, he cannot do. No, Shabbos lunch. Shabbos lunch is the Rabbana. Certainly can't do it on Shabbos lunch. Certainly can't do it on Shabbos lunch. Uh, 
Um, so now, what's, what's, who are uh, Chazal again? The rabbis of the Talmud. The, it's, a, it's an acronym standing for Chachamenu Zichronam Levracha, our sages of yeah, blessed yes. memory. But the, that title applies only to the sages up to the end of the Talmud. After that, we don't use that title anymore. Tanaim and Morim. Tanaim yes, and yes, and maybe even people earlier than that. What time period is that? It ends about 550 CE. That's, that's a redaction of the Babylonian Talmud. So now, um, the Rebbe Zatzal said, sometimes you can have one cause which has dual opposite effects. The very same cause has dual opposite effects. Yes, it's true. If you see the Sota being punished and disgraced, that will definitely be a motivation to make sure that you don't end up there. But there's a secondary effect that it has also, and that is you know she did it. That is to say you know she went into hiding with another man. You know she did it. And if you know she did it, the natural thought is, well, she's probably not the only one. The only one? Probably not. She did it. People are doing it. And if people are doing it, it's not so bad. It's not so bad, because we judge ourselves comparatively. It's false to do that. If you think about it and say it abstractly, of course you reject it intellectually, but it's instinctive. How well am I doing? Let's imagine an Avera, and you are under the impression that no one does that. No one ever does that. I think that the motivation to avoid it would be overwhelming. What? I'm going to be the only criminal in the Jewish world who does that? The only one? Now you find out that 15% of the whole population does it regularly. Oh, oh so this is so terrible that 15% are doing it. Some of them are probably like me, and it's, it's understandable, and it's excusable. That thought is totally irrational. It's forbidden, and you have to use your resources to try to fight against it. But the fact that other people are doing it automatically makes it much more acceptable to me psychologically to find myself doing it, uh, you, yeah. Why? Why wouldn't they then encourage like the to be counted to raps if it's possible to encourage other people? Like if her public shaming is going to encourage other people, why would the Bible or wherever that like why would why would it encourage the woman to do that? To, to be publicly shamed? Yeah. Because we're talking about an event that has a double effect. It's a double effect. It has it has a positive effect in that people see the disaster that comes out of it. Let's take drugs. Shall we publicize people whose lives have been lost to drugs? It has a double effect, same double effect. So you have to make a calculation, what's more likely, what's less likely, what will affect the majority of the population? It's not, it's not obvious which way to go. <clears throat> the Torah stresses in many cases, for many types of crimes, that publicizing the punishment of the crime will have a deterrent effect, and it will have a deterrent effect. It will also have an effect of loosening, lowering people's resistance because they'll say it's something that people do. So now, what the, what, the, what, the, what the Torah is saying here, the way the Gemara understands it is, you saw it, you understand that this is the punishment and the degradation, that will have a, an effect on holding you back and, and protecting you. And for the publicity of it, take a precaution. So then you can have the best of all, of, of all possible worlds, right? And that's why you're told not to drink wine. But what this points out, by the way, uh, you can read about this. Uh, I lived through it, but you can read about it. In the 50s and 60s, a fellow named Kinsey uh, authored what he called the Kinsey Report, where he reported on American sexual practices. Uh, and it came out that 10, 15, 20 percent of the population were doing things that nobody dreamt people were doing. And there was an immediate explosion of this kind of behavior, especially on college campuses and, uh, and certain, uh, certain um, locales like San Francisco. And because everybody said, golly, look, everybody's doing it. So they used that kind of logic. The fact that almost all the subjects in his study were prison convicts, which isn't really a representative s sample, would you think? Right? Today, no one would trust the statistic gathered that way. That people blurted it over. The liberal press, of course, uh, publicized it because they wanted to attack uh, people's uh, morals and mores, and it, it became a terrific cause célèbre, which caused many people to simply, if you publicize the number of people who commit adultery, the result is you ruin marriages. Because there are people who say, if everybody's faithful to their spouse, I'm not going to be the, the only bad ap apple in the barrel 
who's, uh, who fails at this. But if 10% of the people are doing it, so then there's nothing wrong with it. Or it's not as bad as one would have thought and has all that kind of, uh, of deleterious effect. But what this alerts us to is that the very same thing can have simultaneous effects that are good and bad. And that makes it quite difficult to decide, to classify and say it is good or it is bad even in a particular circumstance it can have good and bad effects. And then very careful evaluation has to be made ultimately as we made by the people who are the um, scholarly leaders of the generation to decide how it should be handled. I assume that what I've said so far is, is clear. Now I want to apply this to a famous holiday, um, Purim, uh, Purim, which I'm uh, sure that you have heard that there is a mitzvah to get drunk on Purim and to see exactly how to understand that. Uh, this will cons uh, require considerable background. Let me start with the Tikkun Zohar, which is astonishing, and then it will be our goal to be able to explain it. Uh, on the 10th of Tishrei, we have the, den the Day of Atonement. Anyone know what day, day is called in the Torah? Yom Kippur? No. Was it? Yom Kippur is never used in the Torah anywhere, ever. That's what we call it. The Torah is called... Yes, it's called Yom Kippurim, mm -hmm. in the plural. If you thought Kippur meant atonement, it would be the Day of Atonements. Astonishingly to me, almost no commentators comment on it. They just, you know, I looked at the commentaries on the, on the verses. One of the commentaries, Shulchan Aruch, gives an explanation for it. I think it was the Maril. But it's never, it never appears in the, in the singular. Now, you know that the words in the Torah are written without vowels. So the Tikkun Zohar suggests, don't read Yom Kippurim. Put in an extra dot under the chaf, vertically, and read it Yom Kippurim. A day like Purim. Okay, here we go. Yom Kippur is going to be a day like Purim. Oh, that's really challenging. If you were to ask someone to set up two polar opposites, two days of the year that are opposites one another, Yom Kippur and Purim would be very good candidates. Right? Right. Yom Kippur, you spend the whole day in shul, and you don't eat, and you don't drink, you don't wear leather shoes, you don't wash, you don't have sexual relations, and you stay spending the whole day in prayer and repentance and pleading with God and so on. And then Purim, Purim, you know, you're drinking, you dress up in costumes, you're making jokes and collecting charity for, and you're, you know, you're having generally a good, fairly loose, you know, celebration. How could the Tikkun Zohar suggest that Yom Kippur is a day like Purim? And I want to push this po a question a little further. I forget one of the Akronim makes this point. If you say A is like B, that's not the same as saying B is like A, and it's not like saying that A and B are similar. Those are three different statements. A and B are similar is neutral. It means they just share some qualities. A is like B means B has a certain quality and A approximates B. B has it and A has it approximately, but not the same. And B is like A is the opposite. Right? He being told that Yom Kippur is like Purim. Means there's got to be some quality which they share, but Purim has it stronger. Purim has it more thoroughly, more ideally. And Yom Kippur just approximates the way Purim has it. <laughs> That's mind-boggling. Now here's one way to explain it. A human being is a soul in a body. Don't make a mistake. Don't think that you are a soul riding around in a body. You are a soul and a body. The body is essential to your identity. That's one of the reasons why at the end is resurrection, because the agent that lives and performs, does mitzvot and sometimes does the opposite, is a soul and a body. In the end, the agent has to be judged. That's a soul and a body. And according to everyone, except Maimonides, and I think over Jewish history, Maimonides has been outvoted on this, the world to come, also, the soul and the body are both there. Hmm. Now, the soul is created in such a way that it is naturally drawn to certain things in a certain direction, to the holy, to the pure, to the beautiful, to the intellectual, to the true, to the right. The body is created so that it is naturally drawn 
in a different direction. Now, carefully, the body is drawn to what is pleasant, what is immediate, what is rooted in the physical world. It might be right or wrong. It's not perverse. The body's not perverse. The body's not looking to rebel. The body doesn't want evil for evil's sake. The body's like a bull in a china shop. It may break the china because it's going through to get the candies at the, at the cash register. You know, it, and it may break. It doesn't want to break the china. It doesn't care whether it breaks the china. The body is morally and spiritually blind. And because it's morally and spiritually blind, if it just is allowed to follow its own impulses, sometimes it will do things that are wrong. The reason why a human being is composed of a soul and a body is this. The key to human life is free will. You only have free will if you have competing motivations. Motivations that pull you in two directions. If all your motivation and certain questions are one side, you do not exercise free will when you follow that motivation in your action. A very good illustration of this was in a paper in the Journal of Philosophy uh, about uh, 15 years ago or 20 years ago. He said, imagine a lawn party and at this estate, there's a pool. You're standing next to the pool, and an 18-month-old child falls into the pool, and you're the only adult in range. The child's going to drown. All you have to do is lean over and grab the child's shirt and pull him out. You won't even get your pants wet. It won't even cost you a dry cleaning bill. Right? Now, the author of the paper said, what is it that's in your motivation in favor of saving the child? Well, it's a human life, and the parents will love me forever, and I'll have the, the esteem of all my friends, and my, you know, my conscience will, will praise me, and so on and so on. Good. What in your motivation is against saving the child? Now, don't imagine a monster here. Yourself, your own. Think, you know, meditate on your own motivation. For I imagine everyone in the room, and the vast, vast majority of people, there's nothing in favor of letting the child drown. Nothing. No struggle here. No loss in saving the child. There's nothing in favor of letting him drown. Under those conditions, said the author of the paper, you're not exercising free will. Free will requires conflict. Then the will can decide between the two conflicting sides. But without conflict, there's no free will. So, we are the only creatures in the creation that have free will. Okay, maybe angels have 0.0001%, you know, on occasion. We are the only creatures... Which, that are designed for free will, that's why we are composed of two different elements. Soul and a body. No other creature is composed of two different elements. They don't have to be. They're homogenous because they have one essence and they act out that essence. But we who have to have free will are composed of two competing elements. And life, largely, for most people, most of the time, is living out that struggle and using free will. Now, 363 days a year, the goal is to coordinate the soul and the body to do what the Torah wants. And that will typically mean that the soul has to exercise both clever gerrymandering of the circumstances, plus sometimes brute force, to bring the body along to do what the Torah wants to be done. That struggle goes on 363 days a year. There are two days in the year which, is not, which are not devoted to um, coordinating the soul and the body because in each of those days, one is in charge, one is on display, so to speak, and the other is subordinate, subjugated, background, de-emphasized. One is Yom Kippur and the other is Purim. In Yom Kippur, the body is put on the back burner. You don't eat, and you don't drink, and you don't bathe, and you, and you don't wear leather shoes, and you don't have sexual relations. So, and you're spending the whole day in prayer and study, pleading with God. It's a holy spiritual day. Yes, you have to breathe, and you, the law of gravity will apply to you, but the normal bodily activities are very severely reduced. And your consciousness, the body, isn't part of your consciousness. Now, um, I just report to you the experience of the vast majority of people. If you believe in the Torah, and if you believe in the themes of Yom Kippur, and you believe that your life is on the line, and you have an opportunity by what you do in Yom Kippur to be forgiven and rehabilitated for all the mistakes of the past year, when it's an hour before the day's over, 
you're not thinking an hour to the coke. <laughs> when you're davening the ila, you're not thinking how many minutes to the meal. That's not what you're thinking about. What you're thinking about is, this is my last chance to accomplish a revolution which will affect the whole past year or even beyond the past year. It goes back to the past sector, my whole past of my life. That's what grabs your attention. So the body is put out of your focus, out of your experience. You know, it, it's sort of like if you're running a race, a mile, or I used to run cross country, which is two and a half miles, you know, and you come to the last 200 yards and the people in front of you and you're trying to make a final effort, you're not thinking, wow, when I get over the finish line, there'll be a Coke waiting. What you're thinking is, how much faster can I get over the finish line? Because that's what you're focusing on. Um, I used to wrestle. In the middle of a match in college, I broke the big toe on one foot. I didn't know I'd broken it. I didn't feel any pain. My foot stopped working, a kind of reflex. I won the match on points anyway. Uh, but foot, as soon as the final bell rang, I was in enormous, excruciating pain. But while the match was on, I didn't feel the pain because I was focusing on the match. That's what Yom Kippur is like. So it's definitely in the background. Now, when it comes to Purim, comes to Purim, if you drink and if you get drunk, the soul's control of the body is going to be blotted out or very, very much reduced. Things which during the year, the soul, the intellect would say to the body, no, no. The soul can't exercise that control. Everyone knows that when you're drunk, you do things which you wouldn't do under other circumstances because you lose control. Indeed, for many people, that's the point of getting drunk. Because I can't, I can't survive being under control all the time. Okay, so in that sense, Yom Kippur is the soul day, and Purim is the body day. And the normal experience of soul and body being equally present, equally real, equally demanding, and working to coordinate them, that experience is 363 days a year, and Yom Kippur and on Purim it is very much reduced because they are very largely one-dimensional days. Okay? So now we have what Yom Kippur and Purim have in common. What we haven't explained is why Yom Kippur is called a day like Purim. That's supposed to indicate that whatever this thing is they have in common, Purim has it more. It's more ideal, more thorough, more complete <coughs> than it is in Yom Kippur. That we haven't explained yet. And that's the final step for this part. Um, during the 363 days, people struggle. They struggle to use their free will to do what it is right to do. When they do, that means the body becomes involved in what the soul determines is what should be done. Now this can happen in two ways. Uh, let's take desire for food. Uh, your stomach, my stomach, stomachs are blind. It makes absolutely no difference to the stomach whether the sandwich that gets eaten, for me, if it's my sandwich or if it's your sandwich and I stole it. Stom stomach couldn't care less. Stomach would be equally satisfied. Stomach doesn't care whether today is sukkahs, when it's mitzvah to eat, or your kippah when it's asa to eat, or January 22nd when it's up to you. You want to eat, you don't want to eat. It makes absolutely no difference. Stomach doesn't care. Stomach is absolutely morally blind. So now, there are two ways to involve the stomach in doing what the soul wants. One is, you're hungry, find a meal which is a mitzvah meal. A mitzvah meal where it's a mitzvah to eat. Somebody's celebrating the completing of a tractate of the Talmud. Masechta, see you Masechta, go and join him. And add to his, to his joy. And when you do that, it's a mitzvah to eat, and it's even a mitzvah to enjoy it. Um, or a bris milah, or a pidyon ben, or all the cases where you celebrate some uh, occasion by having, by having a suda. One of the Talmudic sages says, I only eat a suda when it's a mitzvah. I don't do it, I don't do it with any other time. That way you're uh, subverting the, 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 the stomach. The stomach wants it. And you're creating the circumstances in which what the stomach wants is actually good in spiritual terms. The other way is when the stomach wants something that's wrong in spiritual terms, Someone wants somebody else's sandwich, or wants a sandwich in Yom Kippur, then the soul exercises control over the body and, and says, no, 
I know what you want, but now, now it's not the right time. Now it's not the right conditions. It can't be done now. <clears throat> now let's imagine a person, I'm observing him from the outside, and I see that all his actions are right. He always gets it right. Respect the food, whenever the environment is filled with non, non-kosher food, he has control. Whenever it's a, a, a suda that's a, a mitzvah, he does it and he enjoys it and he's happy and he enjoys it. And the, and the, he always gets it right. There's still an ambiguity. There's still an ambiguity. Is it that he always gets it right because he has very careful control? Very careful control. The soul is always alert and focused on controlling the body to get it to do the right thing. Or could it be that through years of control, the body also learns, is trained, absorbs a spiritual reality to the point where the body also wants what the soul wants. Is the conflict permanent forever? Or is it possible to get to the point where the soul, the soul trains the body, elevates the body to the point where the body also participates in the soul's commitments, the soul's priorities, which are spiritual. Yeah. If I put a piece of pork in front of you, there will be no choice as to whether you're going to eat it or not. So you won't have free will in that situation. Your choice is already made up from all your years of observing the laws of not eating pork. Or okay, good. So now that's one good example. And of course, you chose an example, but as you know, and it's obvious to everyone else, you could multiply those examples beyond uh, without without this. It does look like if you live something habitually to a certain after a certain point, it becomes habitual. Especially if you're training yourself to do or not to do something which your mind tells you is right, and you do it consistently enough, the, the opposite just loses its attraction to you. You don't you no longer have the attraction, and according to what I said, the name of that paper in philosophy, you then no longer will have free will. So it means at one point in your lifetime, you will have free will, and then after a while, that free will will fade. As to that specific thing. Oh, that's good. So we'll have to talk now about what happens in the rest of life, but that, I think that's, that's absolutely true, and that is an example, at least to some extent, that the body can be trained. I can tell you as a Tshuva, one of the most difficult mitzvot that a Tshuva has to confront is mincha. <laughs> Mincha is very inconvenient, especially in the winter. It comes the middle of the afternoon. I'm busy in the afternoon. You know, I'm doing things. So, no, Mincha. To stop at what, you, what you're doing and daven. And for a beginner, davening isn't six minutes, you know, rattle it off. <laughs> it's a little more complicated than that. And you struggle with that. Now, after 20 years of doing that, the attitude is the sun's going down, the world could stop. I don't care. I'm Tavani Mincha, the world can disappear. <laughs> because after a while, it just becomes a non issue. That, that is quite true. I think that's quite true, and that's an important piece of evidence, yeah. Doesn't it not really matter whether or not you have to think about doing a mitzvah? Because I know Judaism bases your, like, I guess, value on actions and not thoughts. So to think, oh, I have to make sure I make this commitment. Or if you just do it automatically, it doesn't really not matter. Oh, yeah. Shall I tell you this? I'm glad you're sitting down. The idea that Judaism is based on actions and not thoughts is false. Really? Okay. Yeah. It has absolutely no source whatsoever in any genuine Jewish source. For example, at the end of the morning prayers, in the prayer book, you have the 13 principles of faith. Those are thoughts. Ramonides, from whom they are taken, says, anyone who doesn't share those principles of faith isn't Jewish. Those are just thoughts, number one. Number two, when you do a mitzvah, you have to intend that what you're doing should satisfy the commandment. If you don't, you didn't do it, and you have to do it again. The Mishnah uses the following example. Um, I'm writing a Sefer Torah. So I'm right. And typically when you write, you have a text, and you're writing it into the parchment, and you read it as you go. Now, it's 7.30 in the morning, and I'm going. Shema, Yisrael, Shem, Kainu, Shem, Echad, next line. Hey, wait a second. It's 7.30 in the morning. 7.30 in the morning is the time of the Shema. And I just read the Shema. I haven't fulfilled the mitzvah to do it again. Because I didn't intend that my reading 
should satisfy the mitzvah. So uh, this picture that it's, it's actions and not thoughts is put in those terms is certainly false, but it's also, it's also philosophically false. An action by definition contains a thought. If a gust of wind blows you onto, onto someone and you break his arm, you're, not, you're going to say, I'm not responsible. Why not? Your body broke his arm, didn't it? Because it wasn't the result of my thought and my decision. It's only an action if it's a result of my thought and my decision. Motions of bodies are not actions. You know, a twitch is not an action. A twitch is something that happens to a person. And my example, because I lived through the Vietnam riots and all the rest, when the Vietnam riots took place, the city councils had to decide how to deal with it. And one proposal was beat up the protesters, beat them up good. <laughs> now, there were two groups in favor of that proposal. One was the arch conservatives. They're bums, they're hippies, they're, you know, uh, trying to tear down the government. Beat them up! The other ones in favor were the arch radicals. Because they said, yeah, beat them up and you'll stimulate the revolution, we'll overthrow the government. So now, the proposal is, is put on, on the table. Shall we beat up the protesters? Hands go up. You don't know what that hand means. That hand might mean preserve the government, and that hand might mean destroy the government. That depends upon the thoughts that are going on inside. A human action is not a motion of a body. Human action is the motion of a body that embodies a thought and a decision. And that's that. I think the Jewish position here agrees with what philosophy would say about the nature of the human being and the nature of human action. Yeah. So let's say that hypothetically we didn't know that giving tzedakah was a mitzvah. And we give tzedakah. We're not fulfilling the mitzvah correct. of giving tzedakah? Correct. That's quite correct. The Ramban says in, the, in, the, in his introduction to his commentary in the book of Job at the end, a person who's an atheist has no mitzvahs at all. Now, don't get confused here. You gave a good example of, of tzedakah, charity, because there's a Rashi that people misunderstand, a Rashi in Chumash, where, it said, where he says, if you have a hole in your pocket and money falls out and a truly poor person finds the money and takes it, then you will get a blessing for that. But he doesn't say you fulfilled the mitzvah. He specifically doesn't say you fulfilled the mitzvah. Because we hold it mitzvah tzrichos kavana. Uh, mitzvah tzrichos kavana means you have to ha intend that what you're doing fulfill the mitzvah. Otherwise, it's not. And, and think about it. The word mitzvah means commandment. Can you say you obeyed the command if what you did fulfilled it by accident? Because you weren't even aware there was a command. You didn't obey the command. You did something which the commander said should be done. But you didn't obey the command. He has no relationship to the commander. A system of commandments means. Okay. So now that's okay, that was a bit of a, a bit of an aside. So now, now, so now back to work. Can we train the body? Now, one thing you I mean you said it very well, and you said the, the limitation very well as far as you got. Um, the normal picture of Desta writes about this is I have a certain amount of free will. Free will is like muscles. And I can use it for a certain uh, number of challenges. I may know that I'm failing on 16 different fronts. If I look at my capabilities, honestly, I'll say, I can work on three of them. But I can't work on all 16. I'm just able to work on all 16. So then, if I work on one, and I work on it, and I habituate myself to it to the point where it becomes automatic, that frees up my free will to work on one of the other ones. The question is whether I can picture a circumstance in which it'll be all finished. Will there be nothing left to conquer? <coughs> Well, I will, I will create habits that cover the totality of all the mitzvahs that I have to do. I think that's an open question. I think it's an open question. I don't think you can bring a proof from, from psychology to that. Uh, my children never had to fight my battle with mitzvah. No? They learned to have mitzvah from the time they were children. By the time the boys were 12, 13, the girls were 12, they were in the same position I was when I was 30. The world could stop. I'm davening mitzvah. Do they pay attention to every word? Probably not. So that's where their free will is. Uh, uh, now, is this an infinitely open uh, path where there's no, no limit to it and you always have challenges for your free will? It would be natural to say such a thing. It would be natural to say such a thing. Okay. Yeah. Are there, are there any laws of intent? <coughs> How do you specify intent? How do you know that you actually intended to do something? Okay, I, I think you're asking the question because you're not taking the, the word intent uh, um, um, strictly enough. Intent is a very thin notion. Um, it's not motivation. We're not now talking about why you did it. We're talking about what you 
intended to accomplish. Right. I make out a check. I make out a check to the. I make out a check to the IRS. Right. What am I intending to do? Pay my taxes. Is it because I'm afraid of the police? Is it because I believe in what the United States government is doing? Is it because I want to protect my reputation for the next time? I love? Who knows? That's motivation. But it's easy to know what I'm doing. I'm paying my taxes. Right? So here also, I know God said to say this, this, these six words. And what I want, I say, when I say them now, I want that to fulfill what he told me to do. That's, I don't think that's difficult or subtle or... But did you think they say it out loud or do you think about it, is that enough? Oh, so first of all, thinking is enough. It's an intention. It's an intention. It's called a kavanah. Um, and you can, and this goes back to something, this is what you said, but I, 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 I don't think you, you were referring to this particular type of case, where if you have set a life policy of doing something, then you might not, at the time, stop and close your eyes and say, yes, I intend, or think I intend this, because that's what you do. You say Shema to fulfill the mitzvah. That's what you always do. Someone tap you on the shoulder and say, what are you doing? So, it's a mitzvah every morning to say Shema, and that's what I'm doing. Right? So that may be enough. That, it may not have to be conscious. It can be a consciously adopted policy, which you're now following without conscious thought. Uh, Rabbi Heinemann in Baltimore gave the following example, which I have used over and over again. When you wash Friday night for the meal, you have to have in mind where you're going to bench. You, you may wash here and intend to go to somebody else's house and finish the meal there and bench over there. The time you have to, have to intend that is when you wash. Now, you're in shul, and somebody says, I'm making shalom zohar, and I would like to have a minion of people to, to bench after the meal. Please come and finish your meal with me. And I say, sure. What time you want me? 9.30? I'll be there at 9.30. Fine, I get home. Table is set. There are guests at the table, and uh, we, we we sing and we make kiddush. I go over to wash. I go to wash. I get me Friday night, and I wash. I sit down. What am I thinking about when I'm washing? I'm making the bracha. I'm washing, and how I'm going to introduce that guest to this guest, and so on and so on. Am I thinking about the fact that I'm going to bench at my friend's house? No. But uh, Rabbi Heinemann, if someone would tap me on the shoulder and say, "Where are you benching?" By my friend's house, by the Shalom Zacher. I already decided that. So if I'm carrying out a conscious decision, it doesn't have to be what the philosophers call an occasional. Occasionalism. It's got to be consciously focused on at the moment. Um, so that, that may be that. May be that. <coughs> but it can't be just ignorance and carrying out physically what the mitzvah says. That's not enough. That's not enough. And I say, I don't think there are subtle cases here. In motivation, there are subtle cases. What's really moving me? Well, it's really my purpose in acting. But an intention, that's why intention and motivation have to be distinguished very carefully. Okay, so now, to some extent, you certainly can train the body. And you may train the body over many areas of life. And there may be still some areas that are, that, that are beyond, but they may be very esoteric. Paying attention to the words that I say when I pray, no one can tell whether I pay attention or not. Now, if drinking wine on Purim blots out the soul's conscious control of the body and lets the body operate on its own, here's an opportunity to test what will happen when the person gets drunk. Will the body behave in an exalted spiritual way? Or will the body just tear things up? Here's a way to test whether the constant control during the year has had the effect of sinking the spirituality into the body or not. I have a friend, many years ago, got drunk on Purim. He lived in an area where he lived like on the second floor, and there's a balcony and a big flat, there's like a wall in the balcony which had a big flat expanse. You could put pots and flowers and things like that there. And at the other edge, there was no, 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 um, no really? fence, no railing, because no one's supposed to climb up there. That was the wall for the balcony. He put one of his kids on his shoulders, and he climbed up there and was dancing up there, dead drunk. Now, Baruch Hashem, nothing happened. But when he was told afterwards that that's what he did, he decided he will never again get drunk on Purim. Because he thought he had control, or he thought the body was trained, he thought he was in sync, he thought everything would naturally go well, and he did something that was very dangerous. He himself had no clue that that's what was going to happen. 
Now, if you see great people get drunk on Purim, I should tell you, many people have a policy of not getting drunk. My Rebbe preached against it. He never did it. And we were told, as his Hasidim, not to do it. The Ramah talks about it. Ramah says, you want to get to the point where you can't tell the difference between Mordechai and Haman? Take a nap. <laughs> when you're asleep, you can't, you can't, you can't tell the difference. The Mechaba Paschal that you should get drunk, and uh, there are various different opinions. And different groups have different, different ways of doing things, and it's not up to me to decide. You know, it's not, not, no question of deciding who's right and who's wrong. But I know that, that many people say that, that you shouldn't get drunk. But if you see people who do, like Rashi Yeshiva, what you see pouring out is such love of Jews and such love of Torah, things which people who are naturally more private, more reserved, wouldn't express that way. But uh, a Rosh Hashiva can take a, a student, give him a hug, and give him a kiss, something that he himself would never allow himself to do under any of the circumstances. He may be inhibited that way, but on, uh, but on Purim, he can do that. There you see that the person's living of Torah has saturated the body with spirituality so that when the conscious control is blotted out, that's what the body shows. Now, um, I believe that, I mean, as I said, my, my tradition for my Rebbe is not to get drunk, period. But I believe that if a person is going to get drunk because he has a different tradition, so on, so on he's got to be a person who's convinced that when he gets drunk, his body is going to demonstrate the spirituality with which it's been saturated by the constant guidance of the soul. If he's not going to do that, then getting drunk the idea that, oh, you see how realistic Judaism is? Once a year, get plowed. No, that's not a Jewish idea. And if that makes Judaism less realistic to you, too bad. My job is to teach you the truth, not to pander to your, to your, uh, to your desires and, you know, and, and say that everything, everything's okay. The idea of just getting wild uh, because it's Purim, and by the way, there's no mitzvah to drink at night. I don't know where this idea has come from. You even find it in the yeshivas where the guys get drunk at night. There's absolutely no mitzvah to drink at night. The Purim Suda, in which, you get, uh, in which people drink, is the daytime. Only, uh, only the daytime. At any rate, that's what <coughs> it's for, to demonstrate that the body, too, can be spiritualized. Okay? Now, how does that answer the question? What question? Let's go back. The question was, we said, right, Kippurim. Yom Kippur is like Purim. We said they share something, but they share it in such a way that Purim has it more thoroughly, more completely, more ideally, and Yom Kippur just imitates it or approximates it. What was the element that they share? That, unlike the 363 days a year, each one is one-dimensional. Yom Kippur is the soul day, Purim is the body day. Still, Purim is much more thorough, much deeper, much more consistent than Yom Kippur. Why? Because in Yom Kippur there are two. There's a soul and a body. It becomes the soul day by pushing the body aside. By pushing the body aside. By eliminating the competition of the body. That's how it becomes a one-dimensional day. But they remain two. They remain two at odds with one another. So it becomes an ex expression of soul by pushing the body aside. On Purim, you get a vision that they aren't two. They aren't really two. The body could be spiritual also. That's a much deeper vision. There may be differences in, in, in focus, differences in effect, but at base, they're one, not two. That's a much deeper philosophical vision. The truth is, that vision is based on the foundation of all Judaism, and that is monotheism. If there's only one God, how could it be that there's something which is wholly, completely, intrinsically evil? How could that be? Didn't God create it? Isn't God good? It has to serve some good purpose. It can't be. In order to hold that there's absolute evil, you have to be a dualist, like Zoroastrianism, or like poor Emil Fackenheim, who was a noted philosopher of Judaism, so the weakness was that he couldn't read Hebrew. Um, but that didn't stop them in universities. That didn't stop them in universities. Yeah. Um, and he, in order to deal with the Holocaust, said we have to realize that the Holocaust is absolute evil, and it's a new starting in Judaism to deal with absolute evil. That's Zoroastrianism and certain strains of Christianity where there's good and evil, and each one has its own independent source, and they're in conflict with one another. It's an utterly 
on Jewish ideas. So you're getting the vision now that the soul, that the body too is a spiritual element only. Its spirituality is in potential. It's something that can be spiritualized. It doesn't start off rooted spiritually. It's something that can be spiritualized by its interaction with the, with the soul. That's a very, very profound revelation. That way, Yom Kippur is a day like Purim, but only to... Uh, to. So now, here is Yom Kippur, here's Purim, where people are drinking. And drinking blots out a large part, if not, if not totally, the conscious control of the soul of the body. Is that good? Is that bad? What I'm saying now is, it depends upon what it will reveal about the body. To reveal about your body that you're still in a primitive state and it'll do wild things, that, that, that you don't need to advertise that. <laughs> and you don't need to, to, to give that expression. Uh, but if you can reveal this about the body, then you have something that's, that's uh, very worthwhile. And you, uh, when people see it, when they observe it, it's like a revelation. A, uh, especially among Rosh Yeshiva, Rosh Yeshiva, their practice is one what we would call tzniyus. Tzniyus means privacy. You don't, if you didn't know when I was becoming, just becoming from, you're walking <coughs> to, a, to a yeshiva and people are davening, who's the Rosh Yeshiva? How would you know? I mean, <laughs> all these people standing there in, in, in hats and suits. Okay, some in the front, some in the back. Yeah, but <laughs> they're all standing there. You know, there's no way, there's no, no, nothing on display like that. Um, and if Tzniyas is important, Hatzniyas Lechasim Elokecha is a Pasuk in Novi, which applies to men as well as women. Your, your essential relationship to the Kodesh Baruch was private. Then you're not going to show these things. Purim gives a chance for it to come out. And that's a very valuable thing. That's where wine can have that effect. At any rate, you know that we use wine for mitzvos. Um, I think one, one last remark. This, this is a little bit subtle. Um, you make Kiddush on wine, you make Havdalah on wine, and when you have a bris milah or a, a pinyin a ben, whatever it is, a, a cup of wine is, is drunk. A marriage, right? Notice the cup of wine is drunk at the end. It's drunk at the end. I'm not drinking wine to enhance my performance of Kiddush because I'm finished with Kiddush when I drink the wine. So it's not sort of giving me a certain elevation or relaxing me or making me less tense so I can focus better on the Kiddush. The drinking is done when the Kiddush is over. The Kiddush expresses something special about the day. And it's drinking wine that enables me to experience the day in that way. Same thing is true with a bris. You're going to celebrate the bris. You don't drink the wine before the bris is, is performed. You drink the wine after the bris is performed. Because you're now in a new reality. Now, what wine can do for you, and we're talking about three or four ounces of wine. <laughs> you know, for the average person today, you hardly know that it's wine rather than water. Three or four ounces, you know, what's that? But it can relax you. It can loosen you up. It can reduce multitasking, which a person actually does, thinking what's going to happen tomorrow, what's going to happen this afternoon, you know, what about that text, and so on and so on. It can reduce multitasking, so it enables you to focus on the item that's at hand. It can have uh, uh, benefits. I know someone who, when he has to speak in public, has to have a glass of wine beforehand. Otherwise, he's too nervous to speak. He has a glass of wine, he speaks very effectively. That helps him reduce his nervousness to the point where he can focus and speak effectively. But that's definitely worthwhile. It enhances life instead of... It depletes life. So under those conditions, wine has to be understood as something that's very, very um, complex. Wine causes the heart of man to rejoice. So the Gemara says, true, give strong drink to the people who are lost. People who are lost. People are depressed. People are frightened. Those are people who may need strong drink too save them from the horrors that they're dealing with. That is sometimes an appropriate thing to do. Not just to get drunk to forget, because when you're sober, you'll have to get drunk again. But to drink, to relax, to loosen up, to reduce the tension and fear, and then you can talk to the person, and then you can suggest the strategies to the person, and you can help the person deal with, uh, with the situation. Wine used correctly is a very positive part of life, 
and like everything else, has to be dealt with very carefully and very subtly.